My name is Stephen Lloyd. I'm the medical director for the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. In 1999, right over there in that corner, I graduated from medical school. Went to David Crockett High School and University High, country boy pretty much. Uh, never dreamed that I'd be a doctor. Had everything in my life really uh, that I wanted after I came through medical school and residency. In the end of my residency, I started experimenting with pain medication, Lortab mainly, little five milligram Lortab. Took one right in front of Colonel Steve's liquor store down here on, uh, not, not far from uh, campus. Uh, half of a five milligram Lortab because the pressures of my life seemed so great. I was getting ready to come out of residency. Uh, I had a son and a daughter who were young and was very uh, discontent. Felt like I had anxiety and my depression uh, was acting up. And before I got home, I felt like I'd found a cure for my anxiety and depression with that five milligram Lortab. Within three years, I was taking the equivalent of 100 Vicodin a day. Not 100 milligrams, guys, 100 pills. Your doctor gave you 90 pills for a knee surgery or whatever, and you were supposed to take that, take that over the next couple of weeks. That couldn't get me through one day. Now, when I graduated medical school over here in 1999, my classmates gave me an award. It was the Gold Humanism in Medicine Award, and it went to the graduating student who was judged by his classmates or her classmates to deliver the most kind, compassionate, and non-judgmental care. And my classmates gave that to me. Still the proudest thing that I've accomplished in my life is that it hangs in my office. Really, I think it's the only thing that's hanging in my office. Within five years, I was sitting in a pharmacy in Orange Beach, Alabama, contemplate robbing it. And my son and daughter are in this audience tonight, and they know that I do this a lot, but they've never heard uh, the story that I'm getting ready to tell you. And uh, I told them before I came up here to, to uh, be patient with me because they were little kids then. But at the time I was using 100 milligrams a day, or not 100 milligrams, 500 milligrams a day. You're going to the beach. I'm using 100 pills a day. I need 700 pills, right? That's a lot of pills even for me. So I get my hands on them. We take off to the beach. And, and when I get there, you know, I'm thinking, I've got 700 pills. I'm in good shape, so I'll just take as many as I want to. And I'll take fewer tomorrow. So I ran out on Thursday. Okay, Thursday. Just going to check my time. All right, I ran out on Thursday. And, and so I know I'm getting ready to get dope sick. And those of you in the audience that have been dope sick, you know what I'm talking about. You wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. So I drive around Orange Beach, Alabama, trying to find a pill mill, and I couldn't find a single one. And I'm starting to shake. I'm starting to sweat. I pull into the Rite Aid Pharmacy right there on Perdido Pass. And I'm sitting there in the car and thinking, okay, I'm, if I write a script for myself, I'm a doc, I can do that, but the DEA will catch me. That's illegal. I'll go to jail. And so I start thinking that I'm going to rob this pharmacy. Guys, I had everything in my life that I wanted. I grew up here. I had more money, more cars. I had the house that I wanted. My wife and I live in our family home. I married the woman I met who was, when she was a 19-year-old freshman here at ETSU. Really, I didn't want for anything, and I'm sitting outside of a pharmacy thinking about robbing it. How in the heck does that happen to a guy like me? The guys, it started with one pain pill. And I'm going to try to explain to you how that happens over the next five minutes. But I can tell you this, I had a moment of clarity sitting in that parking lot that night. And that moment of clarity was that I cannot recover from this. If I do this, if I rob this pharmacy, I can't recover. And so uh, I, I just went back to the condo. I became dope sick for the next three days. And I know my kids back there remember this beach trip because I was miserable. And my wife, Karen, had to drive all the way home from Orange Beach as I laid over in the passenger seat, uh, seat sick. I got home got my hands on pills and I was fine within about uh, three or four minutes after getting my hands on the pain pills. But guys, when we're talking about opioids, we're talking about pain pills and the queen bee of all opioids is heroin. The fastest rising demographic in the state of Tennessee for heroin users. Anybody know what it is? It's 20 to 24 year old white suburban women. Guys, it's soccer mommies. It's soccer mommies. We lose 53,000 Americans every year to drug overdose. Those of you my age, uh, remember Vietnam, that is more than all the soldiers we lost in Vietnam. And I get people all the time, I love treating uh, drug-dependent pregnant women. It is the most fun that I've ever had in medicine. These women inspire me on a daily basis with what they do. They are amazing. Yet a lot of times we throw rocks at them. We say, oh, well, don't they know what they're doing to their babies? Why don't they just stop? Okay, or we kick them out, or we don't give them places because they're addicted to drugs, guys, and I'm telling you, that's wrong. I went to a place down in Greenville not long ago, and it was a drug treatment center getting ready to open, and one of the city councilmen there said, Jesus Christ wouldn't, help, wouldn't try to help the alcoholic from behind the bar. That's what he told me. And I said, then my Sunday school teacher lied to me. 
Guys, if Jesus Christ was roaming the earth today, these are the people he'd be with. I'll guarantee it. Guarantee it. So, <laughs> but I'm going to... I'm going to talk to you about how this happens, right? And, and, and I'm, you know, they told me, you said, Steve, you got 10 minutes to cover the neurobiology of addiction. 10 minutes, all right? And now I'm down to like five. So I'm going to do it in five. Guys, there's, and I don't know if y'all can put my one picture up. I have one picture. Can you put that on the screen for me? If you can't, then I'm going to have to describe it. Ah, uh, yes, there we are. Everybody recognize that? That is the human brain, right? And that's me looking that direction. We've cut me in half. We've knocked this side of my body off. I want you to focus on that little arc right there in the middle. A little arc right in the middle of our brain, guys. That's our reward system. That's our limbic system. It, is, it has one purpose in life and one, person on, one pur purpose only. And that is to make sure our species goes forward in time. How strong is your desire to live? It's damn strong, right? It for sure is strong. Okay? If you, if you hold this place off and you taped everything up, and we didn't have any food or water, it wouldn't be very long before we would start deciding what order we were going to eat each other in. That's how strong your desire to live is, and that's the responsibility of the limbic system right there. And that limbic system works like this. What do we have to do to keep our species going forward in time? Right, number one, we got to live to be reproductive age. And number two, we got to have sex. Okay, those are the two things that we've got to do. Now, what do you have to do to live to be reproductive age? You got to eat water, Eat food and drink water, right? Sorry about that. Big crowd, all right? You've got to eat food and drink water. Those things had better feel good or you won't do it. If every time you ate, you threw your toenails up, you'd stop eating and our species would die, right? But you know when you eat, you feel good. About two minutes after eating, here's what happens in your body. About two minutes after you start eating, your body starts to make its own. Morphine, heroin, fentanyl, oxycodone, Lortab, they're called endorphins and enkelphins. And those endorphins and kelpins attach to the opioid receptors in that area of your brain, and it leads to the downstream release of something called dopamine. And everybody in the room loves dopamine, right? Because dopamine is that chemical that's released whenever we're satisfied, we're content. It's an overall feeling of well-being. And you know that's exactly how you feel on Thanksgiving Day after you fill your belly up, right? That's exactly how you feel. And, and God designed us that way because he wants us to repeat that behavior so our species can go forward in time. That's how he made us. Sex feels good. I realize I've said sex twice in church, now three times. All right. So sorry about that. Sex feels good, guys. If sex didn't feel good, nobody would do it and our species would die. Right? That's the job of the reward system in our brain. Here's what happens to people who get on opioids. Okay? It hijacks that system. That system that carries us forward, that is, that is, the, is responsible for us uh, loving life and wanting to continue life, it is hijacked. Okay? And a matter of fact, it's hijacked to the point that people's cravings for opioids are 10 times stronger than your cravings are for food when you're hungry and water when you're thirsty. I want you to think about that. That's how strong it is. And people get desperate. Think about if you didn't have food, how desperate would you get? You'd get desperate enough to eat the person sitting next to you. When you don't have pills, you don't have heroin, you get desperate enough to do anything, prostitute yourself, you'll lie to anybody, you'll do whatever it takes. Guys, hate to sin, not the sinner, right? The, the answer to this problem in the state of Tennessee is in this room. We got all kinds of treatment programs. won't matter if we don't have a support system for these folks when they get out in the community. The biggest untapped resource that we have in the state of Tennessee is right here. It's our faith-based organizations. We had six and a half million people in the state, four and a half million of them identify with faith-based organizations. This is where it'll happen. It'll happen here. Now, getting, getting, back, getting back to my brain again. Can you put my brain back up there? That's not mine. Obviously, this person isn't doing well. Uh, <laughs> sorry, shouldn't make dead guy jokes. All right. You put it back. In. So the ward system of brain, this is a part of our brain that, that's hijacked. Okay? The frontal part of our brain is a part of our brain that gives us insight and judgment. And in drug use, that insight and judgment part of our brain's erased. So if you think about somebody who's addicted to pills, they're only driven by that one thing, and that's the desire to move on, the desire to feel good, and they don't have any insight and judgment. Now can you see why they make the decisions they make? And I get people all the time when they find out what I do, say, Steve, you treat pregnant women. These women just need to stop. Can't they see what they're doing to their babies? And I go, why, thank you. I never thought of that. you got to be kidding me. Right, and I've gotten less smart aleck over the years. Now I tell them, okay, that's fair enough. I agree. I'd like for you to stop eating. Okay, right, because it's ten times easier for you to stop eating than it is for them to stop taking drugs. And, guys, that is the, that is the God's honest truth. Now, there is hope. I'm 13 years clean and sober. I hadn't had, a pill hadn't been in my mouth. Yeah. 
But I'm going to tell you what the key moment was. I had world-class treatment. I had great aftercare and follow-up. And, guys, I'm the medical director for the whole state of Tennessee now. The Capitol building's right outside my window. I walk in my office every day and go, good Lord, do they know who they put in charge? I'm bad to drink and do drugs. Um, but I'll tell you this. I'll tell you what changed for me. August 16, 2004, I told, I told my counselor I'd kept one secret from him. And I walked into his office and said, Chip, I need to talk to you. A guy named Chip Dodd in Nashville. I said, Chip, I need to talk to you. I walked into his office. I said, I got something to tell you. And Chip's the kind of guy to make you, you know, he could make you confess to being the 20th hijacker. Okay, he, he could look right straight through you. And Chip, uh, I said, Chip, I stole drugs from a cancer patient who was dying. It's pretty bad, isn't it? I said, but I wasn't really stealing them because I just turned around and wrote them for him again. So I wasn't really stealing them. But guys, we all know, right, I was stealing drugs from a cancer patient who was dying. And, and over Chip's shoulder is a picture of the prodigal son. The whole thing is depicted in a painting, and I'm looking right over his shoulder at that picture. Chip leans back, and he said, Steve, that's bad. He didn't pat me on the head and say, it's okay, honey. He didn't try to you know, patronize me. He said, that's bad. He said, but I love you, and God loves you, and I forgive you, and God forgives you. Well, the first time in my life I ever believed it, because the way I was brought up and the things that I saw, uh, people forgave you right until they needed to stick you, okay, to get you to do something that they wanted you to do. And I realized at that moment what Chip told me was true. Guys, that's what you often do. We're traveling across the strait trying to educate communities and churches on addiction to try to get them to become addiction-friendly organizations. I, my lifeliners are right down here over to my right. These guys are unbelievable, and women are unbelievable. They travel the state getting congregations to educate themselves on addiction and to become, uh, to become resources in our community to help people because, guys, I'm going to close with Johan Hari's line. Johan Hari wrote a book called Chasing the Scream. If you're interested in what I'm talking about at all right now, Go on Amazon, buy it. Go to Barnes & Noble, buy it. It's a paperback. I promise you it's worth your time. The last line in his book, Yohari says, the opposite of addiction is not recovery. The opposite of addiction is relationship. And, guys, that is the God's honest truth. And that relationship can be in this room right here. Um, and on a personal note, just because I, I've been clean and sober for 13 years doesn't mean I have struggles in my life. Brittany called me to do this. I had no clue what it was. It was in Johnson City. I could come home for the weekend, so that's what I did. And God puts you where you're supposed to be no matter what. And in some struggles I'm having in my life right now, I sat back there before we got started and thanked him for bringing me here tonight. So thank you all for doing this. Hope you got something out of it. <laughs>